What's the worst thing you've had or seen done by someone who was supposed to be a professional? Number one. So this past week, my father has had a valve replaced during open heart surgery. The first set of nurses were amazing. Over the moon, that kind of great. Then he started falling sick again while still at the hospital. He needed a pacemaker because his heart stopped beating. My mom and I were sitting on pins and needles because he had a positive test for Aunt Marissa. Now it was unlikely he had it because the sample size was so small. The infectious disease doctor was great, explained it all, and sent out for immediate cultures. So we go in and out of infection precautions, depending. And he can't get the pacemaker because we're waiting to see if these new cultures come back. This is where we hit unprofessional number one. My mom and I would meet in the general eating aria either when they were doing a, a procedure on dad or when he was eating. We sat through breakfast on Saturday, listening to this woman talk loudly to a table of nursing students. There is nowhere else for us to eat since it is. A small RIA and my dad is in ICU. You aren't even supposed to eat in their waiting rooms. So all through breakfast, she's going on and on, not teaching, just talking loudly and complaining about her back and this and that, eh, hey, whatever. Then lunch comes around, and this time, the same group is out there. She is now hardcore ragging on the hospital, the doctors, the nurses, so-and-so isn't her boss, and she's tired of hearing that, and the students are talking about how much they are worth to the hospital. So I finally got up and let her know just how unprofessional she was to be sitting in an area where patients' families are complaining about the place they hope will save the patient. I was madder than I should have been with the stress of my father. I get it, you hate your job, but do what the rest of the world does. Go home and complain about it on social media. Teaching future nurses to complain while you are at work and not caring who is around is not professional at all. So dad's results are only at 60 hours, but they can't wait for full results on the MRSA tests. He's not going to live without a pacemaker. Just put it in immediately. The disease doctor cares, listens, is wonderfully informative. Not so over the top that you are confused, but enough so you know what is going on and the risks we are still facing. So then we move on to Dr. Unprofessional. My dad looks like Santa. In fact, he is Santa to many kids. He loves his beard. The doctor comes in and says, to get the pacemaker, the beard has to go. Now dad has just had open heart surgery and no one messed with the beard. Dad tried to explain to the doctor, but he just wouldn't listen. Our first warning flag was when the doctor asked how my dad was. Dad said, terrible. And the doctor said, well, that's nice. We don't have a choice on the doctor. And this is who was sent because dad must have this pacemaker. So dad goes to the cath lab to have the pacemaker put in and he asks for a swallow of water or ice chips. His mouth is terribly dry, and they want him to answer questions. The nurse says, we'll answer them first, and we'll see what we can do. He can barely talk because he hasn't had anything in hours. Finally, another nurse decides he needs to take a pill and gives him a swallow of water so he can talk again. So then they bring someone to put in another IV. Dad had an IV in that hand already. They took it out. He had a PICC line put in the night before, and they had already taken it out previously. So here he is, an IV and a PICC line in his right arm. But nope, they need another IV in his left. And they bring in some old woman who took five minutes before finding a vein. So mom and I leave. They take him back, give him a painkiller to hopefully put him in twilight sleep and get to work. Dad said the painkiller did nothing but wake him up fully and make sure he was alert. Doctor didn't care and went through the procedure anyway. Doctor says he wants dad back in the ICU to watch. He ends up on the fifth floor. It has been a really long week mixed with some wonderful professional people who are really trying hard to help him. And then some people who I have no idea what they thought. Nursing and doctoring were a good career choice. Number two. I had wrecked my mountain bike on a south mountain trail and hurt my arm pretty good. I also broke two rims, cracked my helmet, and blew out my front shock. I was in and out of consciousness on the road to urgent care. Because it was early Sunday morning, the first two places we went to were closed, and we ended up at a little clinic. This young doctor, three years out of med school, cleaned my wound and then stitched me up. He gave me two pain pills and told me to have a good day. Well, 
Apparently, you're not supposed to stitch wounds up like that and are supposed to let them drain and breathe. I went in two days later to get more pain pills because my arm hurt so bad it was keeping me up at night. The doctor on staff told me I had to be admitted to a hospital with an ER immediately because my whole arm was infected and it was starting to reach my lungs. I had a massive infection that ended up hospitalizing me for days and then I had to have surgery. I spent more than a month packing and cleaning out a dollar-sized wound. Worst experience of my life. No, I didn't sue. We thought about it but figured that would only contribute to the broken healthcare system. I guess I came to terms like this. The doctor had to learn somewhere. There are always people graduating at the bottom of the class. We have a membership for those who like more naughty and interesting stories that aren't advertiser friendly. Check out the link in the description and join our amazing confessions community so you can support the channel. Number three, dentists will appreciate this one. My girlfriend at the time was unhappy with the appearance of her teeth and rather than go with orthodontics, which my very professional dentist had recommended, she opted to go with the instant solution of crowns and veneers, nearly a dozen in all, suggested by a dentist at some random strip mall. Doing this work required her to get six root canals. Her first appointment for the work was a Friday at about 2 p.m. They worked on her for three hours, and when it was 5 p.m., it was quitting time. They stopped work, put a temporary bridge on her, and said they'd see her in two weeks, when her next appointment was supposed to be scheduled, and sent her home. Once the lidocaine wore off, she was in agonizing pain, and by Sunday, she literally asked me to end her. Calls to the dentist's service went unreturned, and Monday morning, she called and was told the pain was normal and they wouldn't see her earlier. That afternoon, I called my dentist, explained the situation, and brought her in immediately. He gave her some lidocaine, which provided instant relief, and then took the temporary bridge off. Next, he said out loud, holy crap, and told his assistant to get the camera and took about 50 pictures. He left and went into his office, and then came back, put the tent back on, gave her a script for Percocet, and told us to call her dentist again and make an appointment. We did, and it was scheduled for 7 a.m. the next morning. Apparently, they had started six root canals on Friday, but not completed any of them. Just opened the tooth and exposed the nerve, but not actually destroyed it, and left the tooth open with a minimal packing, but no actual filling, and expected my girlfriend to live with that for two weeks with no pain meds. I talked with my dentist about it on a later date, and according to him, this was about the single most painful thing a dentist could do to a person. And had they not taken the appointment the next morning, he was going to hand the pics over to the state's ethics review board. That location eventually closed, but it was part of a low-end, corporate-owned dentistry chain that I think is still around. There was some other shady stuff that happened a few weeks later. While she was still wearing the temp, her gums got inflamed since it wasn't fitting properly. The dentist didn't show at the appointment, and the receptionist, who had no dental accreditation of any sort, not even as a dental assistant, ended up covering for the dentist. <sighs> what the heck? <laughs> That's got to be illegal in more ways than one. Number four, I once got my oil changed at a Walmart tire and lube express at the beginning of a 1,500-mile trip. I checked it that evening at our first stop, some 200 or so miles away, and found it to be just as black as when I dropped it off. They hadn't touched it. The time and distance between me and that particular Walmart meant that there would be no chance of arguing for a refund, even if I tried. And more recently, I needed a new battery in the midst of a nasty snowstorm. Though I knew better, and am quite capable, I opted for their free install rather than stand out in the crappy parking lot of my crappy apartment with the flashlight in my mouth in the cold. Two plus hours later, I was called back to the TLE and informed that the battery terminals were quote unquote broken. I was invited out to the shop to see for myself, joining the brain trust of three to four employees who stood looking under my hood. The terminal connectors on that car, a 2001 Focus, had little steel bars that went over the expanding end of them, which kept them from expanding, so I took a flathead and popped them off. I mean, it was just a complete lack of any mechanical aptitude whatsoever. Swear, that's what they were looking for in TLE employees. More time spent waiting equals more time spent wandering Walmart, hopefully buying crap. Number five, I'm from Spain and my parents are from Spain as well. I speak Spanish without any accent, not even a local accent. I speak like people on national TV, but I'm white. 
There's no reason for anyone to think I'm a foreigner, but I have a French first name followed by the two most common Spanish last names. So I once had a consultation with a psychologist. She had my medical history before the consultation, and the first thing she asked me was if I was having a hard time adapting to the country. I told her I'd always lived here, but I had a French name because my mom moved to Switzerland when she was 18 and moved back to Spain to give birth to me. So she was used to French names. So she asked me if my parents were having a hard time adapting to the country. I told her again that my parents were Spaniards who had briefly spent time in Switzerland 25 years ago. Then she asked me again if I was finding Spain very different from my home country. At this point, I started getting irritated, but went along with it because I wanted psychiatric treatment and she was the one who had to refer me. During the 45-minute session, she asked me several times if I was having a hard time adapting and made numerous references to my status as an immigrant. To this day, I still don't know if she was crazy, banked, or just not listening to me. Number six. My wife went to a professional conference out of town when she was seven months pregnant with our first child. It was about a four-hour drive from home, and she was a little concerned, so she asked me to go with her. She didn't consult with her OB again, and while we were there, her water broke. We went to the local hospital, and they said she was going to be bedridden for the next several weeks. So unless we wanted to stay there, we should get in the car and drive like hell back to our hometown. So when we got home, we went directly to the hospital, and they admitted her. They kept her in a bed with her feet higher than her head and checked her several times a day for infections. Her OBGYN was nowhere to be found. My wife was an RN at the same hospital where she was staying. Her friends, other RNs, would come by and chat with her frequently. They let her know that the OBGYN was mad at her for leaving town without telling him and to everyone in the hospital about her. After she'd been there for a couple weeks, the OBGYN finally showed up. I was in the room, along with several of her friends. He smelled strongly of alcohol, too. He walked up to the bed without saying anything while pulling on a glove. He pulled up her gown and jammed his hand in while everyone was standing there. He then made a few incomprehensible sounds and stormed out. We didn't see him again for a couple of weeks. The test for infection finally came back positive, so they were going to induce labor. Her OBGYN showed up, and even though the staff doctor said she could deliver normally, her doctor insisted she needed a cesarean section. My wife was really disappointed, but we went along with what he said. We later found out he wanted her to have a cesarean because he had a tea time that afternoon and didn't want to miss it. I wanted to complain, but he was the head of obstetrics at the hospital where my wife works, so there would be repercussions to her job if I did. This needs to be reported. Substance use while you have patience under your care is one of the worst disservices I can think of. And smelling strongly of booze, it is not necessarily me and he was intoxicated, but his actions were unacceptable at the very least and actionable at the most. If you've made it this far in the video, hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. It helps the channel grow. Number seven, I was taking courses via distance. In order to complete my university degree and one particular class was an economics class. The professor that semester was filling in for the regular professor and had never talked via distance before and was using the regular professor's materials. No big deal. It's not really that hard. So midterms roll around. We write the multiple choice midterm and our proctors mail it back in. Being as there are people across the country and often in other countries taking the course, the tests take a while to come back and be graded. Cool enough. So one day we log on to the online courseware and see that our grades are posted along with a very long and ranty email from the professor. The entire class failed the midterm. She insisted that she double and triple checked the answer key and it was right, and that she'd never had such a thing happen before. She also admonished us for not studying hard enough and that we really had to work to pass the final. As you can imagine, there was nothing but uproar amongst the class. No one could believe that not even one person passed the midterm. So we waited for the midterms to be returned to us, and along the way, she decided to compromise and offer us a very fair final, double all midterm marks so they were where they should be, and use the better mark between the two for the course grade as long as the final was passed. Now, 
It's three weeks before the final, and everyone is flipping the hell out to ensure we completely understand the material. Online study groups are created, questions and discussions abound. Then midterms began arriving back at students' homes. We began posting questions about the answers. Why was X wrong for question A? The professor gave very lengthy and detailed answers. For the first few that had been posted, we were confused. The answers she had given us were to questions that weren't on our midterms. The professor went silent. After berating us for being idiots and insisting it wasn't her fault, the professor profusely apologized for inadvertently correcting all the exams using the answer key for a different version of the exam. The best debacle I've ever seen in my life. Number eight, I'm a diabetic. I went on a trip out of town with my boyfriend and his family. The second night of the trip, I ended up getting very sick with very high blood sugar. There were no hospitals nearby, so we had to go to a clinic. I was throwing up the whole way there into a bucket. Eventually, I was just spewing out water. And when I got there, I explained to them that I only needed a needle to give myself insulin with. I use an insulin pump, but it wasn't working, which is why I got sick. I had insulin on me, but no needle to use it with. And then they just didn't let me have one. They tested my blood sugar, which was 19.5 when I last tested it and said it was 13. So I, I shouldn't worry too much. I told them that they were wrong and that I was throwing up. I was horribly sick. I was literally begging them for a needle or some form of insulin. Instead, they insisted on testing my blood for hours, like literally four hours before I got any insulin. I was in ketoacidosis by the time I got insulin because of how long I had to wait to get it. And the worst part, when the doctor was taking the fourth blood gas test, it's one of the more painful blood tests, I was crying and he decided to make the worst joke ever. Hey, great. Maybe your tears will bring your blood sugar down. Worst experience of my frickin' life. Something else I also forgot to mention. I have some very old tiny white scars on my left wrist that are usually hard for people to see. One of the first things he asked me was, oh, so what's with the scars on your wrist here? In front of my boyfriend and his mom, I was already crying because of all the throwing up I did, and all I could say was, they were there from a long time ago. Can't believe he was so rude and considerate, and to be blunt, stupid. This sounds so ridiculous that it must sound like I'm lying, but I swear on my life, I am not. I've never been so infuriated with a doctor in my life. Number nine, I work as a summer rec director for the local school district, so I basically spent my days watching 30. Children of various ages are one around a playground and get into trouble. Now, some of these kids have special needs and, in that case, may have an aide to help keep an eye on them. So one day, some boys, about 10, found a hornet's nest in the ground and, unknown to me, decided to poke it with a stick. Of course, this pissed the bees off, understandably, so they started to swarm around the area. I realized and started warning the kids to stay away, and while I did, a boy named Tim with autism started wandering over, oblivious to the problem in my shouts. His aide just stood there and frickin' watched him do it. I ran across the park, grabbed him, and carried him away, slapping bees the whole time. He got stung five times, twice in the face. The aide said she had a phobia of bees and didn't want to get too close. To clear up any confusion, it was a yellow jacket nest to be specific. And I'm not sure if they are technically hornets or wasps, but where I'm from, people commonly refer to them as hornets. When I call them bees, I'm quoting the aide who was incorrect. This is part of the reason I don't think she had an actual phobia, but instead, like most people, felt anxious around stinging insects. That and the many other times she was dangerously irresponsible while doing her job. I have nothing against people with legitimate phobias, though. Number 10. So, my immediate manager was a pretty cool dude. Unfortunately, he was the epitome of middle management. He had no real authority, couldn't hire without approval, couldn't fire without approval raises, big decisions, nobody told him anything until the last minute, and so on and so forth. I felt bad for the guy, but he had his niche in the world, coached his son's soccer team, and seemed happy enough. I was an hourly employee, so no benefits, PTO, sick leave, none of that crap. If I was there, I got paid. If I wasn't, I didn't. There was a classification, HDE, in our whole division for hourly employees but I was the only one in Mr. Middle Management's section of 20 or so. Well, one day, we have a staff meeting. Mr. Middle Management obviously doesn't get to run it, 
So some bigwig calls all 20 of us into a conference room to discuss new company policies. Great. Whatever. After he goes through all of the hurrah, good team BS, he just casually tosses out there that the budget for HD employees has been cut by 30% effective next quarter and then tells us to have a good day. So here I am, in a room full of people, finding out about my 30% pay cut from a guy whom I've never met and will likely never see again. Mr. Middle Management is finding out for the first time too. I slink back to my office, and over the course of the next hour, nearly all of the 20 people in the meeting come to visit me to see what it was all about. I left at 11 a.m. to keep my cool, the single most unprofessional moment of my life. Number 11. I had a really rough patch during the 10th grade, depression from a close death in the family. I had lost a cat, felt disconnected from my family, stressed from school. I started thinking pretty dark thoughts. I, my math teacher was the professional one, talked to me, and we both decided to try talking to the school counselor. He was a man in his 50s, but would request that I visit him alone. I always brought my math teacher with me though because I just felt more comfortable having someone aware of the situation with me. He continued to request that I see him alone. It got to the point where it felt like he was disappointed seeing the math teacher follow me into the room. I ended up getting spooked and stopped going, ignored appointments, only to have the math teacher come up and talk me into going with her. He eventually called my parents and let them know of the situation when it became clear I was getting worse. When I still didn't bend to his requests of seeing me alone, he got angry and told my parents I was messed up in the head and needed severe psychotherapy. It still doesn't feel right five years on, and I never got the issues with me fixed. I've been too afraid to speak to anyone. That old dude you were seeing was incompetent and an a-hole. It's worth tracking down a good therapist, though. They really do help. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and click the link in the description to join our community. You can check out this video on your screen in the meantime, and I will see you in the next one.